Okay, welcome. This is Dr. Morton. This is uh, uh, the lecture for uh, microprocessors uh, systems one, micro one, and for Tuesday, uh, 9 15 2020. Uh, so let's just first take a quick look at the syllabus. So here's the schedule, and you can see here we are on the 15th, and basically we're going to do some more in class programming uh, examples. and. Uh, I'm not going to do a demo program now. I'll do that on Thursday, and I'll spend a little time going over the laboratory for Thursday. But what I want to go through today, I want to want to work through several uh, <clears throat> example program segments, uh, much like we did on a previous lecture on Thursday. So let me get rid of this. Um, and oh, by the way, before I totally get rid of that, uh, notice that the programming test is going to be on the 29th. And so the things I'm going to cover today will be on the programming test. So you need to uh, you need to make sure you pay attention and know how to do this. Uh, obviously, we'll change the variables around and the locations and the exact details of the questions uh, so that you'll need to understand how to do it, not memorize and just regurgitate. Okay, so uh, that having been said, don't forget uh, homeworks. Uh, uh, two is due uh, the seed uh, at midnight on Tuesday, and then homework three coming up. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change this out. And um, oops, it's not what I wanted. I wanted this. Uh, so I'm going to switch to this camera here, and um, I'm going to expand this, and then I'm going to uh, use my hopefully use my surface and do this now sadly oops sadly I've already done this once uh, but the video uh, was screwed up I had the wrong screen being uh, recorded which sad but anyway what can you do sometimes you just can't win for losing okay so what we're gonna cover uh, and so what we're going to cover is we're going to do the for loop again. We're going to we're going to uh, we're going to learn how to exchange two variables. So I think I'm just going to go through all this. I'm just going to do it all again. So one, we're going to uh, review uh, the for loop. And I think also I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this just a minute. I'm... Okay, so first we'll review the for loop. I did work through that uh, for you um, uh, earlier. Uh, on, well, on uh, the lecture Thursday. Two, we're gonna we're gonna talk about how to how to exchange two variables. And you do have to use a third. Okay, so so we're going to do that, and then um, yeah, we might even do this, and then three, three we're going to. Um, uh, we're going to learn how to uh, uh, configure a register. Now we've already done that with the OSCON register and I'll probably use that as an example again but I'll just talk about it in a little more detail. Four, we're going to uh, configure uh, an input so a GPIO, I don't know why that stupid thing did what it did. GPIO digital input. And then finally, we will uh, learn how to poll on a uh, 
bit in a um, special function register like like uh, like uh, port B for instance as in the push button now after we do this we're going to talk about interrupts okay so that's the plan and uh, hopefully we'll get that knocked out okay so first first we're gonna we're gonna do the for loop now remember to do the for loop to do the for loop there are several things we have to do a we have to um, uh, we, we have to we have to uh, create create and uh, and 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 uh, put in to the index variable its initial value so we're gonna have to create it and we're gonna have to put in the initial value and then we're going to have to put a label on the loop on the start of the loop and then we have to uh, set up the end of loop test Now for this, we're going to use the decrement f skip uh, skip. Uh, sorry, decrement. Golly, why is it doing this? Okay. To do this, we're going to we're going to have to set up the um, we're going to use the D E C decrement F skip on zero. I must have something turned on. Oh, ink to shape. Oh yeah, turn that off. No wonder. That's what I was doing wrong. I have never decrement F skip on zero instruction. Okay, perfect. So you should be familiar with this instruction. Remember that this instruction takes a file register and a location one bit, which can be either uh, which can be either W or F for leave it in W or leave the result in the file register. Now, almost all the time when we use this instruction, we're going to want to leave it in the file register and not W. So we normally will have uh, the file name comma F, and in this case. Um, okay, so so let's say, for sake of uh, so the first thing we'll do we'll set up a variable. Now I'm going to create a little um, I'm going to create I'm going to create a okay I'm going to create a um, so I'm going to create a little um, C block like we've done before. And we're going to start this, say, at 30, like we did before, hex. Um, so 0x, 30. And then down here, we'll create some variables. I'm going to create some other ones. I'm going to create x, y, z. And then I'm also going to create an index i. And then we'll do uh, end. NC block. Okay, now that means X is going to be at 30, Y is going to be at 31, Z is going to be at 32, and I is going to be at 33. And each of these is going to be a byte. Okay, each of these will be 8 bits. Now, uh, this is this is crucial because we definitely want uh, 
we definitely want, uh, you know, we have to do this. Now you could do this some other ways. You can, instead of a C block, you can use the equate. You can use a define. There's a lot of different things you can do. But um, we're, we're gonna use a C block because we've used it before. Now, uh, so these are our variables. Now for this, for the first, uh, uh, for this uh, for loop, I'm just gonna use this, okay? I'm just gonna use I. But we have to create it somewhere. Now, what I want you to notice though is, if we, if we make a little chart over here, which of the variables, it's really important to make some distinctions. So first of all, uh, variable name, location, and value. Or you could also say contents. Okay, contents. Now, we've created several variables. We've created x, y, z, and i. 30, so there. this is at hex 30, 0x30, 30, 31, 32, and 33. Now, right now, the values are unknown. We don't know any of these values. They're just going to be random. And normally we indicate that, we normally indicate that with a, uh, with an X. This is a typical hardware description language notation, but it'll work here too. It means these are unknown values. Sometimes we'll use a U for uninitialized. They, when, the, when the chip boots up, these random access locations populate with an unpredictable value. And so uh, because of that, we don't really know what value they are. Okay, that includes I. Now here's, when we start adding values, one of the things you'll see, you really need to remember that there's a big difference between the, the variable name, which is a convenience for us. This allows us to use a letter instead of, uh, allows us to use a letter uh, in, instead of these numbers, which also helps us sort of remember which one's which. It's allows you to remember X, Y, Z, uh, that we want to switch X and Y, and we're going to use Z as a scratch register. And then our for loop's going to have an index variable of I. Then it is, remember, 33 is our index variable. And oh, was it 32 or 31? But this is the location in the memory of that variable. So I is going to point to location 33. That's what it's, that's, that's where it's about. And then the contents, when we know the contents, will be here, and the contents and the location will be totally different. And what we'll come back to this maybe a little later, but keep in mind that when we talk about indirect addressing, so this is direct addressing. This variable references a number, which is the location where its value is stored. But in indirect addressing, the, the, the register name, in this case, because you don't use... Um, some processors will let you use variables for indirect addressing, but here we, we generally can't do that with this chip. We have to use uh, the indirect address registers. And so the I refers to the indirect address register. You go to that location, uh, which has some number. You take the value that's located there, and that then points you to the actual location where the value is. And so you can see it's a, it's a multi-step process, and that's why it's a little confusing and, and better to to sort of put that on reserve until you, you know, until you got your sea legs uh, in terms of machine programming. Okay, so now armed with this, we'll come back to that in a minute. Armed with this, we're going to do the for loop. Okay, so so first off, we've defined our variables up here. Okay, now somewhere before we get to the for loop, you have to initialize your index variable with its count value. Let's say we want to do the equivalent of a for loop for i equals, say, uh, 15, um, i less than 15, I'm sorry, well, I keep forgetting, I can erase this so nicely, i equals 0, so we initialize it to 0, uh, and then i less than 15, and then we're going to increment i by 1 each time, and then you have some statements, and uh, curly braces, and a uh, curly braces ends it. All right, that's that's your that's your for loop in C or C plus plus. 
All right, when we do it in assembly language, we have to do it a little bit differently. The first thing we have to do, we have to initialize I. So we already have defined I, it's location 33. Now we can forget that and we can just write I and the, the assembler is going to remember that it's in location 33 and it's going to put that number into the actual instruction. So that's nice. Okay, so, uh, so first we're going to initialize it. So we'll make a little comment here. Um, And we're going to set it equal to 15. Now, unlike the for loop where we initialize our index to zero and we count and we count up to um, less than 15 to get 15 counts, at least that's how I think about it. Of course, you in a for loop you could initialize it to 15 and and, and decrement it down to zero, and you could say greater than zero, and all that would work just fine. Uh, but typically in a for loop we count up. But in this for loop this assembly language equivalent of a for loop, we're always going to decrement down. And so, and, and that's just because of the way the instruction works. It, it triggers when it hits zero. Uh, okay, so to do that, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have to bank cell. We're going to bank cell I. And uh, that's because I is in bank zero. I is not in the common RAM, so it's not mapped to every bank. So, so uh, so we have to have be in the right bank, and we don't know what bank we might be in, so we always have to do the bank cell. Bank cell I, and then we're going to move the uh, decimal value of 15, literal to W, of 15. Now, <coughs> notice, if I wanted to do 0x, which I could, if I wanted to put it in, in, uh, in hex, I do 0xf. And that would be 15. Okay, now, so this loads 15 into I. So now we can go back to our chart, and we can uh, we can erase this, and we can put F here. So now that's the value at location 33. The bit pattern, the byte that's there, has 0F. I guess I probably put 0F, and we should probably put 0X in front of it. So 0F is what's there. So it's just 15. Now, we maybe we do some more initialization, set things up, and now, now somewhere down in here, maybe we've, this is start up here somewhere. And then down here we have our, we have our loop. We'll call it loop A. And then at the start of loop A, you know, we have some instruction. I'll put a no op and maybe some other instructions. And eventually, now we're ready to, um, now we're ready to uh, have our end of loop test, uh, which is equivalent to the, it's equivalent to the, to the curly brace, if you will, in the for loop. But we're not gonna use the curly brace. We're gonna use an instruction. And what we're gonna do, first we're gonna bank cell. And we're gonna bank cell our index, I. And then we're going to do decrement F skip. Oh, sorry. I already. Dec D E C F skip on zero. I. Now, this instruction is one of the byte oriented instructions, and it does take the second bit. You must specify, well, it, but it defaults to the, to the F. So it's going to store, it's going to decrement I and store the result of that decrement into I. And in this case, I starts out equal to 15. And when we decrement it, now it's going to be 14. So that's after the first pass, it's 14. Okay. And, uh, and we want that 14 to be back in I. We don't want it to be in W. So we have to put the F. Turns out, it, by default, it'll be F. If we wanted it in W for some reason, we'd have to put a W. All right. Now, what this instruction does, it decrements the, the file register, in this case, I. And if it's zero, it skips the next instruction. But, obviously, if it's not zero, it does not skip. And so then the next instruction is executed. And the next instruction could be a go-to or branch always. That's smaller, so I'll write BRA loop A. And so this is going to go back up here. Now, if it were zero, 
on a zero, it's going to jump here on a zero. But this is not zero, and so it takes the branch. All right, so we'll worry about this in a minute. Okay, now the next time through, it's 13. And the next time through, it's 12. And then 11, and then 10, and then 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. When it comes through at 1, we decrement it. Now it's 0. Because it's 0, this skip on 0 kicks in, and we skip over that instruction, and we execute the next instruction, whatever it might be, and we continue on down in our program. So this effectively executes this number of times. Now let's see. We loaded it with 15, and the first time it decremented to 14. Next time, 13. 12. So one first time, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. When it came through as 1, that last decrement, it did go to 0, so we skipped out. So we actually executed it 15 times, right? Um, 1, yeah, well, 14, 15. It came through as 15. So this is the first time. Well, yeah, the second time it comes through as 14. Sorry. So it comes through as 15. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And of course, when it exits, it's zero, but that's the last time it goes through. It doesn't go through. It doesn't come through as zero. And um, and so so if we load it with 15, we'll execute the loop 15 times. If we load it with 20, we'll load, execute it 20 times. Now, one of the limitations, remember, I is 8 bits. So so in its unsigned form, <coughs> which is how it's treated here. You, you have, you can go up to 255. So that's the maximum. So if you need more than that, you're going to have to have a second uh, test here and do it over again. And that's what the counting loop that you saw in that very first program that did the delay, it's exactly how it worked. Only I used, a, I think I used a, a, a decrement instruction instead of a decrement F skip on zero, and then I tested the uh, Z bit or something. Anyway, so it was just a little bit, it was done just a little bit differently. Okay, so that's the for loop. Now, if we wanted to do this for loop again, before we could do it again, what would we have to do? We would have to re... We'd have to reinitialize i to whatever value you wanted that for loop to count to. Okay, so if we go back here to our little list. We reviewed the for loop, all right? Now we're going to exchange two variables using a scratch pad third variable, okay? So our two variables are x and y, and our scratch pad is z. Now, we put all of these in the same bank, which might or might not be the case, okay? But in this case, it is. So let's, let's look at how we can do this. All right, so now we're going to do exchange We're going to exchange two variables. All right, now, before we can exchange two variables, we have to create the two variables. We already created, we set aside the, uh, the space, but if you remember, there, we don't even know what's stored in them because it just comes up random. So the first thing we need to do is put a value into these locations. Now, the location for x is 30, but that's not the value of x. It's got some 8-bit value we, we don't know because it just when it powers up, it, it, the bits get set randomly. So it could be anything from 0 to 255. Same for y and same for z for that matter. Now we're going to physically load a, specific, a specified value in x and a specified value in y. So let's say for sake of argument, let's say that we want to we want to exchange. Uh, we want x to equal, say, uh, 15, and we want y to equal, say, um, 36. I don't know. We're just making the numbers up. Okay, so so x is 15, y is 36. Very good. So what we can do then is um, we have to we have to load them. And the simple way to load them is to use the, the the move literal to w instruction, and then to move w to x, and then move literal to w for for y, which would be 36, 
and then move W to Y, which would put 36 at location uh, 31, I guess. All right, so let's do that. So first we're going to bank we're going to bank sell. Um, as soon as I get my, we're going to bank sell. We're going to bank sell X. Now since they're at 30, 31, 32, and 33, or 30, 31, and 32, we don't have to bank sell them individually. You take a little bit of a risk when you do that, that somebody else would come through, use part of your code, would move one of the variables into another bank, but then would screw up this code because you're not bank selling each individual variable. You're assuming they're all in the same bank. So usually when we do that, usually when we do that, we'll, we'll put a little comment up here and we'll say, we'll say um, x, y, z, to be in same bank, or some other way. So, so some other programming com programmer coming along with your code should hopefully notice this and not move one of these out of one out of the bank and thereby screw up the downstream code. Okay? So we're bank sell X and now we're done with bank selling theoretically. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna MOV literal to W. And what's the literal? It's gonna be 15. Now be careful. If we do 0x15, then that actually is uh, 21 because that's a hex number. So we don't want hex. If or if we do hex, then if we do hex, then what we should do. Okay, come on. If we do hex, then we should just do zero F. And then we're gonna MOV uh, W to F and that'll be X. So now we're gonna put 15 into X. Then we should do MOV literal to W for Y. I'm sorry, um, didn't want to do that. Was oh come on, what is the matter with this stupid thing? Okay, it's got some kind of. We'll do a large eraser. Okay. So move literal to W. Okay, now. Uh, what I what I want I want 36, oops. I want 36. So what I'm going to do so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do decimal. So I won't do 0x. I'll just do 36. And if we set the radix to decimal, then that will be decimal. And then I'm going to MOV W to F Y. And that's going to put 36 decimal in the Y. So we'll have 15 decimal in X, 36 decimal in Y. So now we can come back up here in our little table and we can, uh, we can erase the, these two and we can put, we can put 15 and 36. I guess I should put zero X, zero X here because these are hex values. But these are decimal values. That is a hex value. All right, so now here's x. Its address is 30, but it contains the 8-bit value 15. Y, its address is 31, but it contains the 8-bit value 36. You must, in your mind, create a total, total distinction between the location, which has nothing to do with the value it's holding, and the value which has nothing to do with the location. Do not, do not get these confused. They are totally separate. The name X refers to the location, but it also embodies its contents by reference. So when we say, what is X? We normally are saying, well, it's 15, because that's the value it has, even though it's stored in location 30. So if we want to say the location of x, then we then we would say, what is the location of x? That's 30. And and in C, this is formally done. We have the we have the uh, 
we have the dereferencing operator, and we have the ampersand, which is the uh, address operator. So if you do ampersand x, you're talking about 30. And if you were using a pointer to x and you do the dereferencing operator, then you're talking about 15, only with a pointer to x. OK. So that's good to keep that in mind. All right, now, this is normally this would normally be done up here somewhere in the setup part or whatever, or whenever it occurs. And then maybe, and maybe we've got some other instructions floating in here. And then finally, we now get to where we want to we want to switch the variables. We want to switch their values, not their locations, their values. We want to take the value that's in the location referenced by x and take that value and put it in the location referenced by y. We want to we want to we want to take the value that's that's now in y's location and or the contents of that and put that in x. Now we have to be careful. If we just take the value in x and dump it into y, we've just destroyed what was in y. And so we can't get it back, so it's gone forever. So if we don't want to do that, we're going to have to save it someplace first. Uh, it turns out there actually is a way to do this uh, without having to use a third register, but it's a little bit complicated and it involves exclusive or. Um, and we're not going to, that's more of a game. We're not going to do that. It, the simple way to do it is just to save it. So here's how we do it. So the first thing we do, because all these, all these variables are in the same bank, we're going to bank cell. We'll bank cell x. We could bank cell y. We could bank cell z, because they're all in the same bank. And then we don't have to bank cell again until we go on to the next thing. So now we're going to take the contents of x and put it into w. How do we do that? That's the instruction MOVF. Now move F comma. Now here's where you must put it put that one bit, which is a zero. You get a zero or one. The W stands for zero, the F stands for one. If I put an F there, it doesn't actually move it anywhere. It just tests it and sets or clears the zero bit. It's a way to test for zero. So if I if I didn't put anything here, it would default to leaving it in X and just setting the zero bit. But if I put a W, it will take the contents of X and move it into W. Now, X still has its original context. That does not erase what's at X. It does erase whatever's in W. It overwrites it with the current value of X, and the current value of X is decimal 15. So now, W is going to equal 15. And we'll make that a comment. All right, now, uh, now we want to put that, can we write that into y? No, because if we wrote it into y, y would then, the previous contents of y, which happens to have been 36, would be erased forever. So we don't want to do that. We want to save it someplace else and then use it in a minute. So in this case, we're going to do what, we're going to do MOV, uh, sorry. We're going to do MOV W to F. And we're going to put z here. Now that's going to take the value of 15 that's in w, and it's going to put it in z. So now z equals 15, which we can go back up to our table up here. And we can now we can get rid of that. And then we can put in 15. All right. Now, Z, of course, is still location 32. Um, but it has now, we didn't know what value was in it before because we didn't look and it just booted up in some random value. Now it's got 15. Now what we can do is we can, uh, now we can load up the value of Y. M-O-V-F Y comma W. We're going to take the value of Y and put it in W. Remember, this is a single bit. You can only your only choice is to put it in W or leave it in Y. So we're going to move F, put it in W, which is normally we'd normally want to move it and put it in W. And and then now when we do that, now W equals 36. The prior value of 15 is overwritten, gone. But it's in Z still. It's also still in X. 
But now we're going to move W to F X. There's no second operand on this instruction. And we take the 36 that's in W and now and now X equals 36. These are all comments. All right. Now, now we need to move F. We move the file register Z to W. So that takes 15 that's in Z, leaves it in Z, but it also puts it W equal 15 now. That overwrote the 36 in W, but it doesn't change the 36 that's in that, that, that went into X. And then we're going to move W to F Y. We're going to take that 15 and put it in Y. So now when it's all said and done, we've switched these values here like that. And the final value in Z will be 15 because it was saving the X value. All right. So that's, that's, that's how we exchange two variables. And note it took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven statements after we had already loaded the values in, which took one, two, three, four, five statements. We never had to mess with Z, although you could clear it if you wanted, but we don't have to. Uh, all right, so exchange two variables, we've done that. All right, let's configure a register. So that should be pretty straightforward. Let's see if we can do that. So let's, let's do the OSCON register again. Now, in the case of the OSCON register, um, let's see. Let's see if I have this still here. Yeah, okay, so here's our data sheet. And here's our OSCON register. Now, notice there, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I'm going to copy these down. I'll come right back over here in a second. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. All right. Now, notice this first bit is the software phase lock loop enable. And you can read all about it right here. If you did not put, if you did not uh, specify the phase lock loop enabled in your configuration word, uh, then, then you can do it in software here, or you can turn it on and off at will. If you did enable it in the configuration word, it ignores this bit, and it takes what you did in the configuration word as done, okay? Uh, and you can't turn it off. The, these next four bits are the IRCF field, and, and if you were programming in C, you could, you could probably just say IRCF equals whatever. In the case of 4 megahertz, it would be D, uh, or, or uh, uh, 12, 13. So we want to put 1101, 1101 one, there. This is un, unimplemented, so it does. It always reads zero no matter what you do. You can't write it because it's not implemented. And then these last two bits are the source of the clock. Now, since we specified the internal oscillator, we can just leave it 00, zero determined by FOS uh, in the configuration word, which we set up as INTOS. Uh, you could also specify directly the internal oscillator. Either way, it's going to be the same thing. So you could you could you could put zero zero, or you can put one. Don't care which could be one one or one zero. We're just going to do zero zero, but you could also put one zero. And so, okay, let's look at that on paper now. So we'll slide this down. So so here's our phase lock loop. We're going to leave it off, and then one one zero one. We'll leave this be zero. And then we'll make this 0, 0. We'll just go with the configuration word. Now we counted out 1, 2, 3, 4. So we divide it right here. 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is a hex 6, and this is a hex 8. So our final contents will be 0x68. That's what we're going to write in the configuration word. All right. Now that we know that, and this is OSCON, 
Now in, in C, we can just go and we're done. So C is a little nicer in that regard. Uh, but we're going to do an assembly. So the first thing we have to do is load up the, va the hex value of 68. Remember, it's 8 bits, so this is an 8 bit number, two hex digits. So we'll take, so we'll bank cell OSCON. And then we'll move literal to W. Whenever we're dealing with constants like this, we always have to use a literal instruction typically. We'll move the literal to W and we'll we'll move sorry 0x 68 you don't have a second operand that's all there is and then we're going to move w to f and we'll put that in oscon no second operand on this instruction either it's funny there are only two or three byte oriented instructions that don't have second operands and we seem to be using them all the time the only one that we've used that did have a second operand so far is the uh, uh, well, decrement F skip on zero has a second operand, and also we did uh, move F, M-O-V-F. Those two have second operands, but mostly all the other Biden instructions do, except for just these handful. Okay, now, now we have 68 loaded into that register, which is going to configure it according to the data sheet, right? The data sheet, the data sheet lays that out very clearly. There it is. So now we have a zero. One one zero one zero zero zero, and that's going to set. It's going to use the internal oscillator as determined in the configuration word, and it's going to program. It's going to program it to be four megahertz, and it's going to leave, and it's going to leave the phase lock. The phase lock loop is going to stay off, disabled, because we don't we don't need it, and it will actually screw things up. So, you have to read on here which one of these have to have the phase lock loop. Um, and this setting does, uh, this chooses between 8 and 32 based on the phase lock loop. Uh, and that's about all you have to do. The only way to get 8 megahertz are the, yeah, I think there's, I think you can get 4 megahertz some other way too. But anyway, we're not going to use it. All right. So we'll shrink this back down. Okay. Now, um, so... Okay, so we're, we're good. We're rolling along here. For a minute, I thought the recording stopped. Okay, um, so we're moving along. So here we are. Let's, um, let's, uh, so now we have this configured OSCON, okay? So that completes our third task. Right here. Okay, okay. Now we want to configure a G GPIO digital input. Okay. Now, when you're configuring inputs, there's a couple things you have to think about. Uh, I'm going to leave. Uh, so every 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 pin has the following registers. It has it has a port register. We'll say port A. Well, in this case, we'll do port B. Port B. It has a latch. It has a tris. It has an analog select. It and then it also has um, two other registers. Let's look at those. So, if we pull up the data sheet again, and we go to uh, our GPIO ports, you can see it tells us what registers they all have. Okay, and. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, and not APFCon. So here they are. So it has um, it has the port A, it has the tris A, it has the latch A, it has the ANCEL A, and then it also has the weak pull up A, WPUA, and the INLVLA, the uh, input level voltage. Uh, level. I guess that's what that stands for. 
port input level control register. And each one of these, if you set the, if you have the, uh, so there's only, in the port A, there are no six bit six or seven, so those are unimplemented, but the others are there. And you basically, a one uh, makes it uh, the SMIT trigger, and zero makes it TTL. TTL is kind of the standard. And now to, to know what those actually mean, you have to go down to the uh, uh, DC uh, electrical uh, specifications, and we have to go down here to uh, to what happens when we, uh, yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, no, uh, that's not it either. Nope. 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 Yes. DC characteristics. So if you're going to read an input low voltage with the TTL setting, then um, if you're between 4.5 volts and 5.5 volts, the threshold is 0.8. Anything 0.8 and above should read a 1. Below 0.8, all bets are off. And then if you have the SMIT, SMIT trigger selected, well, if you're down at lower voltage, 1.8 volts to 4.5 volts, then you have to do 0.15 times VDD. So at 3.3 volts, we take um, at 3.3 volts, we take 3.3 times um, what was it? 1.15. So the level is 0.495. So so instead of at 5 volts. The threshold for a one, you have to be 0.8 or above, but for at 3.3 volts, you have to be 0.495 or above. So you need at least half a volt to get a one. If you're below that, all bets are off. You might read a zero. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, No, I'm, I read this completely wrong. You have to, you have to, you have to be. Yeah, I'm sorry. You have to be to get a zero. You can't be above 0 0.8. To get a to get a uh, at anywhere from 1.8 volts to 4.5 volts to get a zero at 3.3 volts, you have to be below 0.495. All right. Now to get a one, what do you have to do? You have to be above two volts in the 4.5 to 5.5 volt range if you're running TTL and if you're in 3.3 volts then you would 3.3 uh, times uh, times 0.8 plus 2, 0.25 so you have to be above 2.89 volts so at 3.3 you must be above 2.89 volts so look, there's a range between below 2.89 and above 4.95 where you're in no man's land, and we're not sure how it's going to read. It could read 1 or it could read 0, and it could also cause problems with, um, uh, with, with, a, uh, with, a, with a, uh, uh, an, uh, an A-stable state. Okay, I'm on the, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, Okay, so now if you select a SMIT trigger input levels, then it changes the numbers. And let's do the high voltage. So we got for 3.3 volts, we got 2.89. What about 3.3 volts here? So 3.3 uh, oh, sorry. Uh, from the SMIT trigger, you just have to be above 0.8 volts. Okay. So then that's from 2 volts to 5.5. And if you're below 2 volts, apparently you shouldn't use SMIT trigger. I didn't know that, actually, so I just learned something. Um, and, and that's what that, that's what that, uh, that's what that register does. It switches between TTL and SMIT trigger. This is for a 1, and these are for zeros. You have to be below these values for zeros, above these values for 1s, or these values and above. These are the minimum values, and these are the max. 
Okay, and then there's some other pins. Our I squared C lines, when we run I squared C, we have different voltage requirements. If you run them in SM bus, which is a, it's like an I squared C bus, but it's uh, usually, it's the bus that turns power on in your desktop or laptop. Uh, if you're running the master clear, uh, it's got to be read as a high, it's got to be above 0.8 volts at any voltage. And then if you're, if you're inputting, uh, if you're running an external oscillator in HS mode, you get this. In RC mode, you get this. Uh, so you have some other considerations. All right. So enough on that. Okay. Now, uh, so uh, let me just, uh, one thing I did want to, sorry, let me pull that back up real quick and I'll get the correct abbreviation. Uh, go all the way back up to the pins. And we'll come down here. So the two registers that are kind of a little goofy. Uh, so are the uh, weak pull-ups, WPUA, and that one. So WPUA, I don't, I have trouble remembering this, I-N-L-V-L-A, I. N L V L A. Yeah, in level. I N L V L A. Okay. All right. So now, so those are the six registers every 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 pin has. And uh, there's a couple of caveats. For the for the analog select uh, for the ANSO re register, this this selects digital versus analog. Now what's interesting is the analog is the default. Now the TRIS register, this is essentially the data direction. Now all that register really does is it, is it turns on the, uh, it connects the flip-flop associated with that pin to the output. And um, let me get rid of this. So, so that's what it does. Um, and that makes it, that effectively determines whether it's an input or an output. And we'll, I'm going to go over this in great length uh, when we talk about GPIO ports coming up. But for now, this, think of this as a data direction. So a, a, God bless, a zero equals out and a one equals in. And you can think of that as the O and out and the I and in. Okay, now the weak pull-up, uh, they are so weak as to be not very helpful. I've tried to use them uh, as actual pull-ups for inputs and save a resistor on the circuit board, and it, it doesn't. I've, I've had real problems with that, had, that, had trouble getting that to work. So, so I, I don't really use these. The way, you, the way they're somewhat useful is if you have a pin that's disconnected, you should go ahead and turn on the weak pull-up for that pin. So that it's uh, so that it is in fact um, pulled up with something. These are very high resistance internal resistors. Uh, they're they're not uh, they're not they're they're very high resistance. I don't know what they are. They're pretty high. I guess we could do a read about it, but we'll we'll do that later when we talk about the. And then finally, the input level. Uh, you, you really don't have to mess with this unless you're running at real low voltages, then you need to avoid Smith triggers. And there are times when you might use this and it might help you uh, use a pin that would change a threshold if you're trying to use a threshold and, you may, and still have it be a digital. But normally what we'll do when we have that situation, we'll just turn it into an analog port and we'll use an analog to digital conversion and then we can set the threshold wherever we want. And so that's that's actually pretty helpful, but sometimes a, it's a poor man's A to D kind of. Um, all right, so so we we really won't mess with the input levels much, hardly ever. But there are times when you might want to use it, and the Smith trigger does give you uh, some advantages. The major advantage of the Smith trigger is it has sort of this snap action effect, and so uh, it'll it'll uh, it it has a smaller dead space basically. So smaller no man's land between your high and low threshold. Okay. All right. 
So those are the ports. So in order to get our RB7, so our push buttons on RB7, we really want to pay attention. We want to we want to configure. Uh, well, we want to we're going to use the port to read the pin. We don't really need to mess with the latch on input. We can just ignore that. But uh, but we do need we do need uh, to set the tris and the ANSO bits. Now it turned out there's a, there's about four pins. Um, for the GPIO pins, or maybe maybe six. There, so let's see. There's power and ground. So that leaves 18 pins, and there are 12 um, G, there are 12 analog inputs. So there's six there's six GPIO pins that do not have an analog input function, and master clears one of them. Uh, so that li really leaves five that you have to worry about. Those five do not have an ANSEL bit. So theoretically, you don't have to mess with it. But it's still good programming practice to clear that bit whenever you're going to use it as a digital input. For a pin that does have an analog input, if you do not clear the analog bit, it will not work. So you, you really have to do this. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, of course, if you don't set the tris bit as an input, if you set it as an output, you will never read any inputs on that pin because the flip-flop will be driving the output to either a 1 or a 0, depending on what's written to it. And and whatever's trying to come in will be fighting that current. So that, that really won't work. Uh, you'll either have a short circuit, or, but you'll never really see the input. Okay, so so to configure, the, to configure this RB7, the first thing we have to do then is uh, we should go ahead and make the TRIS bit an input. And to do that, first thing we would do is bank cell TRIS. So that points us to the bank that Tris is in, and, and these none of these are in the same bank. They're all in different banks. Ports in, in bank zero, I, for, I forget. Tris, I think, is bank one. I, I don't know. I think the latch is in bank two. Ansel, maybe three. I don't know. And these are four and five, maybe. But um, so you bank cell Tris, and then then we're going to uh, we're going to make sure we set the bit for RB7. So we're going to use the bit set F instruction, Tris. Oh, Tris uh, B, Tris B, comma seven. And that's going to make sure it's an input. It is by default. When you power it up, it'll be set as an input. But uh, you know, it's always good programming practice to do this because uh, <clears throat> if your code gets run after somebody else's code and maybe they configured it differently, then and you didn't do this, you assumed that you're coming out of uh, freshly powered up or reset. You, that might be a bad assumption. So normally we do want to be declarative about these settings. And then, and then now we want to bank cell the AND cell B register. And we want to bit clear F AND cell comma seven. And that makes sure it, it's, you know, this makes it digital and this makes it input. Now, so those are useful things to do. Okay, now, now that we have that done, let's say we wanna, we wanna have a loop where we, so that configures the pin, okay? So that configures a GPIO digital input. Now we wanna pull on that bit. So we're gonna use that same bit that we just configured and we're going to pull on it. What, is, what does it mean to pull? What it means is that we're going to continually read that bit, waiting for it to change from its current condition to the opposite condition. So if it's a 1, we're, we're waiting for it to change a 0. If it's a 0, we're waiting for it to change a 1. And uh, that's called pulling on the bit. And we do that. Uh, like for instance, you might have a program where, where you you start up here, and then you kind of execute commands, and then you get to a command where you want to wait for, not. You want to wait for the user to hit the push button. So you want to stay right here until the user hits the push button. How would you do that? Well, the first thing, we'll 
create a little label we'll call it we'll call it um, crud we'll call it w a i t a we'll call it weight a maybe we've got another weight place so there's our label and then down here um, we're going to test the push button. So the first thing we have to do is bank cell. Now we could theoretically bank cell before the label, but I'll, I'll do it down here. It doesn't really matter. Bank cell port B. So that points us to the correct bank. It should be bank zero for the ports. And then we're going to bit test F skip and we have two choices we can either skip set or we can skip clear we'll pick the right one here in a minute bit test F skips here port B comma 7 because that's the pin that the switch button uh, that the push button's on now what we want to do we know uh, we know how the push buttons hooked up right if this is our micro here and this is RB7 that pin connects down here to a little push button and this then goes to ground but this is also pulled up through a resistor to uh, VDD so that could be 5 volts or 3 volts and our resistor actually is 100k so if the push button is not pushed th then these contacts are not connected so it's open and then the resistor will pull the pin up through this 100k ohm resistor so that it reads a 1. But if the button's pushed, it pulls this point to ground and it makes that 1 into a 0. So then, so pushed, it's going to read 0. Now if you want to wait here until the button's pushed, then you want to you want to skip when the button's pushed, which means you want to skip to clear. Otherwise, you don't want to skip because the next instruction is a branch. I'll use BRA instead of go to, but either one's the same. Branch up to weight A. Okay. But if so, what we want then is what it looks like then we need here is we need bit test F skip clear. So if we come through here and the button's not pushed, it's going to read high or it's going to read set. So bit test F skip clear won't skip. We will do the next instruction, which is the branch, and we'll stay in this loop. And so basically we'll go round and round in this tight little loop until somebody pushes this button and pulls that pin down to zero, and then we'll skip when it's clear to the next instruction. And, you know, and then we'll just continue on with the program. So this will make it wait here until you push that button. All right. So... So that is how to pull on a bit. Now, what you're going to do in lab on Friday is you're going to you're going to use a better method than pulling on a bit. And that better method is interrupts. So you know in lab 2, you used the timer 0 and you and you and you waited in the delay 2 subroutine until the interrupt flag for timer zero was set then you cleared it and then you went back uh, to your to your uh, you returned from your subroutine and that provided a, a, about a half a second delay the 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 interrupt does it differently we still use the same flag but now we're going to turn on the interrupt enable bit which means, and then we're going to turn on the global interrupt enable bit. And with all that turned on, when that flag gets set now, you don't have to read the flag. It will automatically stop the program after it finishes the current instruction, flush the next instruction out of the pipeline, and jump to location 4 in, in the program memory. Location 4 is what's called the interrupt vector. So you need to make sure at that location you put the first instruction in your interrupt service routine. If you want to 
put it someplace else. You can branch. You can put a branch there. But usually it's better just to save that branch and put the, the ISR there, the interrupt service routine there, because it's usually not that many instructions. And then your main routine, your start instruction, will follow that. Of course, you get to your start by starting by jumping to this, to the reset and power up vector, which is location zero, and you have a branch instruction there because you can't put your main program there because it'll run over location four, and screw up any interrupt service routine that you would want to write. So, so that's how that's how we do that. So let me let me um, let me take just a few minutes and talk about the interrupt service routine. So let's just review what we did. So we, we looked we looked how, how we can set up the for loop. This is the second time we've gone over that. We talked about how we can take a, a variable that has something stored in location X, and in, and in this case 15, something stored in location Y. Again, X is 30, Y is 31, but those are their addresses, not their contents. Their contents are 15 and 36. And we're going to switch the 15 and X and move it to Y, and we're going to switch the 36 and Y and move it to X. But Y is still going to point to location 31. And X is still going to be in location 30. So we're not moving the physical locations. We're moving the values held there. All right. And we had to use a scratch pad Z to do that. And, uh, and the first thing we would had to do is load them up with the data at that location. And then we wrote a little routine where we switched them. Uh, and in that routine, we used the, the, the MOVF, the move F instruction. And that instruction, you have to put a W as that second operand, so that, or a zero, so that it puts the contents from, from, say, X into W. And when we did it with Y, the contents from Y into W. Obviously, whenever you move, uh, whenever you move contents from one location to another, you don't destroy what was at the location uh, that provided the contents, but you do overwrite the destination. So, well, and of course, in theory, well, yeah, you overwrite the destination. Okay. Now, um, we also learned how to configure a register, and then we learned how we configure a GPIO port, and then how we can uh, pull on a bit. And you've already kind of done most of these things. Uh, you haven't switched two variables. That's about the only one you really haven't seen yet. All right, so let's take just a minute or two, and we'll and we'll talk about um, interrupts in a little more general sense. Let me see if I can find that real quick. We'll get this set up. Okay, so why do I need an interrupt? Well, the main benefit of an interrupt is it saves us from having to poll. Now, polling's not too bad if you don't have anything else to do uh, with your processing time, uh, but when you're polling your CPU is completely tied up with that activity. And so you're really wasting the power of your processor uh, on sitting there staring at a bit. What interrupts allow you to do, it allows you to automatically uh, have, that, have, that, uh, have the hardware keep an eye on that bit. And as soon as that bit changes, assuming you have everything set up correctly, you, you, will be, you can be off doing other things with your CPU and you're, and as soon as your inter, as soon as that bit changes, the whatever your mainline code is doing will be interrupted, and you will be restarted at location four, which is where your interrupt service routine should be. And the first thing you do in your interrupt service routine is clear the test the flag to make sure it's the flag you you thought caused the interrupt, uh, and then if it is clear that flag. If it's not, you can you can reset the chip or you can report an error or something. In our case, we only have one source of interrupts, so it's either it either it's either the timer zero flag or we've got a problem. And that, you know, I mean, we're not going to have a problem probably, but uh, but anyway, it's just prudent to to check it. And then once you check it, then you clear it. And then once you clear that flag, then you you do whatever it was you were going to do. Now, in our case, uh, we're going to we're going to we want to blink the LED, and so what we're going to do, since when we when whenever the timer times out, we don't know if the current state of the LED is a one, or we don't know if the LED is on or off. So it's easier just to toggle it, and we know that that's going to flip it, whichever it is. So we don't even have to know. We can just toggle it, 
And so that's what we do. We just toggle it each time. And, uh, and so that works out pretty well. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is we have a bit set instruction and we have a bit clear instruction, but we don't have a bit toggle instruction, which is kind of sad. We actually do have that in the KL25Z. So what, do we, what we have to do instead is we have to use a, our byte oriented exclusive OR instruction. The exclusive OR for a byte. Now we don't want to toggle all the bits in port B. Well, there's only four that are implemented anyway, but we don't want to toggle all four. We only want to toggle bit seven, or sorry, um, not port B, we're doing the LEDs. That's the, that's the push button. We want to do the output to the LEDs. And since we're doing uh, RA5, we we only we don't want to toggle the other bits like RA2 is the is the blue LED we don't want to mess with that so we just we just want to change uh, the green LED which is RA5 so that's so all we want to do is toggle RA5 and uh, so what we do is we create a mask with a one in the bit five position and then that then we we exclusive R that mask with uh, with with a uh, uh, our latch A, and that will toggle whatever state bit 5 is in, it'll flip it to the opposite state and basically cause the, L the, the LED to blink. Now I'm going to go over this on Thursday, so I'm not going to write about this. I'm not going to do any, I'm not going to uh, illustrate any of this now. Uh, so, so that's one reason why we, we like to use interrupts. It saves us from polling and we can go do other things. Also, what if we had a, an event that occurred every, say, every 24 hours? Would you want your processor just to stare at that event and pull on that bit and not do anything else for a whole day? No, of course not. You'd want it to do other things. Maybe keep track of time, you know, who knows what. Send, uh, send messages, uh, uh, save information. You'd want it to do other things. And what if that brief event was a very short pulse so that it you know, maybe it was only, uh, you know, uh, one and a half microseconds in length. If your polling loop took three microseconds or even four, then you could miss it in your polling loop. It could come and go while you're looping around, and the next time you test it, it's it's come and gone. You did, you missed it. So clearly, that would be bad. Whereas an interrupt, uh, there is a limit to how fast these pins can respond, but the the interrupt can definitely respond faster than that, fast enough to catch a, a one microsecond pulse. So you might as well, you know, you're much better off using an interrupt because then you won't miss it. Whereas you you definitely might miss it if you were polling on it. Uh, and then to catch, you know, brief events, rare events. And then if you have frequent events, something that was happening, say, every 20 milliseconds, if all you did was pull on that, you'd definitely never get anything else done. And what if they were somewhat random? So two of them might come within a few microseconds, but then, or maybe say 10, 15 microseconds, but then some of them were milliseconds apart. How, how would you be sure that you could be ready to catch the next event? Now, you do have the issue with the interrupt service routine has to be shorter than the shortest interval that you're wanting to catch. Because if you're in your interrupt service routine, your interrupts are off, you will not catch that next bit pulse. Well, that's not quite true. Uh, once you clear the flag, the flag would get set again, and when you exited the interrupt routine, you'd go right back into it and have to do it again. So you 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 have a little bit of slack, but uh, and that's why normally we we clear that flag as one of the first things we do in an ISR. Um, we check it and then clear it. But in any event, um, you there is a limit to how fast the interrupt can respond to a subsequent interrupt. There is a there is some limit to that, and if it's if the if the if the interrupting events are coming super fast, then you you could miss them. All right. <coughs> of course, you could increase the clock speed to 16 megahertz, and, and that would definitely speed things up. Um, that would you know, instead of uh, yeah, that'd speed things up four times. So you'd you'd be doing um, four million instructions. Let's see. So 16 FOS divided by four, uh, sorry, 32. Yeah, it'd be so you'd be doing you'd be doing it eight instructions every millionth of a second, or eight eight million instructions per second. So you could do quite a few more instructions. But in any event, um, 
so that's why we that's why we would normally uh, that's that's some of the reasons why we would normally do interrupts. Now, um, yeah, maybe I'll switch over here. I guess I'll flip this this way. Yeah, something like this. Okay, so again, what it does it, it allows an external or an internal event to cause normal execution to be interrupted and the process some other set of instructions and then as soon as that and usually your interrupt service routine is usually very short and then once that finishes the other mainline routine just resumes wherever it left off um, you can have uh, several different interrupts that can occur or you can just have one like uh, we're just going to have one this friday for the lab but you could have multiple uh, and then some of the processors allow you to prioritize interrupts uh, this processor does not, but many do. Some give you two levels, some give you four levels, some more than that. Uh, so I basically explained this already, and I'm, so I'm not going to talk about this. A, a mouse is a great example of an interrupt. Whenever you move the mouse, that interrupts uh, the other code that's running and, uh, and executes uh, the mouse driver and uh, moves the mouse around and updates the screen. There's all sorts of interrupted events going on there. Um, so in our simple processor we have uh, we have s several things going on here um, but whenever you reset the chip it disables the interrupts you have to turn them back on and you turn them on by turning on the the global interrupt enable bit. Uh, there's also a peripheral interrupt enable bit which you need to set for most of the interrupts but there's a few that that bit does not control and but the global interrupt enable bit controls all interrupts and when you get an interrupt the first thing that happens is that bit is turned off uh, there's several other things that, that happen um, notice that the interrupt flag like we used the timer zero interrupt flag last week in the lab to uh, pull on that to determine when the timer zero had overflowed and uh, so the flag but it didn't cause an interrupt so the flag bit can get set and be cleared and be used and will not cause an interrupt unless your GIE and your and your uh, in the case of timer zero your timer zero interrupt enable bit is turned on and then it will but without those bits turned on the flag will still be set you can clear it you can use it and it won't cause an interrupt unless you have the rest of the bits turned on as well the enable bits um, here's what happens when you have an interrupt the current instru uh, the current prefetch instruction that's getting ready to be processed next that's in the pipeline starting is flushed out the GIE bit is cleared which keeps any other interrupts from happening while you're processing this interrupt it takes the current program counter which is pointing to the next instruction in your mainline routine is pushed onto the stack it's going to be restored at the end and that'll take you right back to where you left off then there's some there's a whole bunch of shadow critical registers that are saved in what are called uh, shadow registers which is context saving and this is all done in hardware which makes interrupts fast uh, so you don't have to do this in your interrupt service routine this is talk, all taken care of for you so once you hit the interrupt service routine you can use the W register and you can use uh, the status register and other registers and you won't screw anything up in the mainline code and then the the program counter is loaded with uh, 0004 hex which then points it uh, to the interrupt uh, vector and the interrupt service routine executes and when you're done with the interrupt service routine you execute the RTFIE RETFIE instruction return from interrupt enable and what that does it restores the context uh, from the shadow registers so that the main routine can continue unabated it sets the GIE bit so another interrupt can occur and it pops the uh, program counter address pointing to the next instruction to execute from the stack and boom the next instruction that's executed then is uh, what was popped off the stack so that's how it works um, the flags can be set whether the enable bits are enabled or not uh, if the GIE is disabled then all interrupts are ignored and um, <clears throat> And the registers that are that have their automatically saved in shadow registers are the W register, the status register, but there's a couple of bits not that are not saved. 
the BSR register, the FSR register, the PC latch register. The FSR makes up a bunch of registers. It's, it's four registers. They're all saved. And here's some registers that are used uh, with the interrupts. Notice you have a bunch of <clears throat> peripheral interrupt enable registers. And here you have peripheral uh, interrupt flag registers. So the flag registers work regardless of whether the enables are enabled or not. If the enables are enabled and the, the, the PI, PEIE and the GIE are enabled, then they will cause an interrupt. For a couple of interrupts, the, uh, the, uh, the INT interrupt and the timer zero interrupt, those will cause interrupts even with the PEIE bit cleared. But all the rest of the interrupts on this chip require it to be set. And there's one other set of interrupts uh, called the interrupts on change, which involve the A and the B pins. And these, uh, these uh, are covered in a separate module. We'll talk about those later. But they can also cause interrupts. Okay, I think that's all I really wanted to cover today. I'm going to pretty much stop with this. Um, well, there's, I'm sorry, one few more things. So there are a bunch of terms that, that are used for interrupts. And some of these depend on whether you have an operating system, a real-time operating system, a big operating system, or no operating system. So we have no operating system. So most of these don't apply to us. But, but uh, like, for instance, if you have a program that tries to do a divide by zero, this is going to cause trouble. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the Intel or AMD chip will trap this and cause a, cause a software interrupt, essentially, that flushes your program, stops its execution, and hopefully doesn't give you the blue screen of death. Um, there's also traps, they call them traps, exceptions, faults, aborts. Uh, there's all sorts of exceptions. And then you can also have software interrupts where the software itself can create an interrupt. Um, and sometimes we'll do that, uh, we'll do that as if a thread wants to return control to the, uh, to, the, to the operating system. Sometimes the thread will cause an interrupt to do that. Uh, sometimes it does it when it does sleep or wants to suspend execution or whatever. Uh, you can also wake up from sleep. You'll see this in the sleep study. We'll do that. And then uh, many systems have what are called non-maskable interrupts, interrupts that you can't basically turn off. Okay, that's it. I'm going to quit there, and um, we will then see you later.